All right, good afternoon, everyone. Any questions? Yes. So your question is, why would one bother to implement a stack or a queue as an array? Um, it's more efficient. So, so the first, uh, uh, <coughs> particularly for, uh, yeah, either way, it's, it's always more efficient to use an array because when you use, let me get some paper out here. Um, let's say you have a linked list. Now the stuff that you're actually storing is in here. And then you do have a significant overhead. You have these objects that by themselves have, uh, each object has, I don't remember, um, two words, uh, so, so maybe 32 bits of overhead for, for maintenance stuff. Um, and also then you have the, the pointer here, which is another 32 bits. Um, and so you're wasting you know, a good number of bits for a fairly small payload. Um, and so you're always much better off if instead you can just put the payload right where it belongs. You know, at some point, uh, you're of course right that uh, there is diminishing return. Um, so if your payload is very large, then the extra overhead of the linked list is percentage-wise small. And so at that point, then you might say, you know, a Q may, uh, to, to use a linked list makes more sense because with a linked list, you have other advantages. Um, there's another reason for queues, why one often makes queues as arrays, and that is when you have concurrent applications you're often kind of interested in not having the queue grow infinitely. Um, what happens in, uh, in those applications, there's, there's producers who bring in stuff that needs to be worked on. And they, uh, there are many of them that work in, dif in different threads. And they will then put units of work onto the queue. And then there are consumers who take the work assignments out of the queue and then work on it. And you don't want the queue to grow arbitrarily large. You'd rather have some of the producing threads slow down. So in that case, it's a finite size thing anyway. And once it's finite size, it's so much easier to implement it as an array. So there are good reasons why you want to be able, you want to know both data structures. There's no one recipe that says, always use a queue, always use, use a uh, stack. Other question? Yeah, go ahead. What's that? You wouldn't like access by index from the array. No, you could. You, yeah, but if the algorithm doesn't make you, I mean, the, the advantage of writing your algorithm with a minimal set of, requ uh, of uh, assumptions is that way you can later swap out the implementation. So if your algorithm only needs to access the top, you might as well give the algorithm a stack, and then you can later choose whatever stack you want. Um, the other reason that people do it is simply for greater clarity. When you read some code and it says, here is a stack, then you know right away what the access pattern is. And neither of them are humongous gains. I mean, you could always just use an array and just you know, constrain yourself to only access the end or say, you know, whatever, I'm not going to constrain myself. But if the algorithm naturally is like that, it, it helps a little bit in reading it to, to know that. And it's a cheap thrill. So. Other questions? So did I make the homework too easy? There used to be homework questions, and I actually thought this, this homework is hard, but. No one has any question on the homework. You're all done with it. OK? Yeah. Um, no, you're crazy. Uh, so no, I honestly thought this homework was not easy. 
And so maybe you guys are getting better. No, and, that can't be it, can't, can't be it right? <laughs> so and then maybe it actually is the case that practice does make perfect. And if you do three homeworks a week, every week, that you do get better at the stuff. These are not easy homeworks. And I wouldn't be surprised if some of you went with some of these homeworks to, your, to, the, uh, to the tutor. And the tutor said, um, I had to think about it for a while. Because they're not the, the kind of run-of-the-mill homeworks that you normally find in the, in the back of the books. So I do try to make homeworks that are hard to Google and that are a little bit off the beaten track. So particularly, for example, the one with the ring, um, you know, that took me you know, probably an hour to implement. And So, so I, I did not think it was a trivial homework. So if you guys can do these things without breaking into a sweater, then that's great. That'd be, for those of you who say, gosh, it's not that easy to me, I'd be glad to answer as many questions as you have about the homework. Um, when I taught this course last time around, that's why these lectures uh, are kind of not so full, because I got so many homework questions with homeworks of the similar difficulty that I figured I'd leave some room. But if no one has questions, I'll have some other way to fill it later. So, um, th but think about it. So I'll go through the lecture, and then if you, have, if you want to ask something about the homework, I'll take that. Otherwise, I'll show you how to, how to debug some of these things, which you also need to know. OK, so this is the section on implementing stacks and queues. And so this is actually, you know, it is pretty easy. Um, there are four ways you can, uh, you can implement these things, stacks and queues as linked lists. And it's pretty much a no-brainer. Um, you know, stacks with, with arrays and queues as, and that's the only new and somewhat interesting implementation, queues as circular uh, arrays. So when you have a stack as a linked list, um, that's my scratch paper. And here in the interest of time, I'm going to draw the linked list the lazy way. You know, maybe I'm not going to just, just so that no one gets any ideas. So, and one always tries to use a singly linked list uh, if one can because the backlinks you know, take extra storage and why, why have it if you don't need it. So we want to do a stack as a singly linked list and now the question is, where do we add, where do we remove? So that's exactly the question I have here. So you could make it so that you know, push ads on the front, push ads on the end, pop ad removes from the front, pop removes from the end. And so I'm just asking you here, which way should it be done? So let me ask that. And so, remember, I asked for maximum efficiency.
So um, let's go through this here. So the first option was push adds before the first and pop removes last. So push was supposed to add, or before the first, that would be here. <coughs> and pop removes last, that, that would be here. That makes no sense, right? Because pop removes the most recent push. So A can't possibly be right. Then it says push adds before first and pop removes first. That's possible, right? Push would push here and then pop would, would then also be here and remove. Um, push adds after last, pop removes last. That's also possible. And D, uh, the four is again nonsense, right? Push adds after last, pop removes first. So it's between two and three. And now the question is, what's more efficient? So let's see what you guys said. And so there's a good number of people who for some reason think that d d four is a, is a viable option, but it really isn't. And so the majority answer is the correct one, that you want to do it at the front of the linked list and not at the back. Because with a singly linked list, what is the efficiency of removing from the end? It's O of N, as we discussed last time, is because it's the predecessor node that's the problem. You don't know the predecessor to unlink. So push and uh, add and uh, remove at the front is O of 1 because you just mess with the head and reroute a little bit. And so that's, that's the answer. Um, and that really is, is simple. So that's all that you ever need to know if you needed to implement as a, a, a stack, as a linked list. It's just a bunch of links and you add and remove at the front. Um, <coughs> stack as an array list, um, it's just an array list. So push adds at the end. And am I asking this? Oh, I, sh I should say that. So it adds somewhere. And we'll figure out where. So push adds somewhere. Pop removes it somewhere. And it's the, the stack could grow very large. So we need to use one of those relocating buffers. And that's an array list. The relocation, as we know, could at some point uh, fill up the buffer and we have to, to grow it. Um, and so these operations, you know, would be not O of 1, but O of 1 plus amortized O of 1. Um, and so now, same question. Where do we, where do we push? Where do we pop? Let me put this in here. Oh, now I can just clone. Okay, I'm going to change my picture here. So now I have an array. It's partially full, so there's some empty space afterward. And the question is, at which end do I push? At which end do I pop? Again, for maximum efficiency. So I would imagine one can again eliminate some nonsense answers here. So 
push and pop have to, just like with the stack, do their work at the same end, because when you first push and then pop, you know, you, they, uh, you, you know, it's either at the, at the front or at the back. So that eliminates two of the answers. And so the real question is, do you want to push and pop at the start or at the end? And, well, this sh should really be blindingly obvious. Um, and it's almost obvious. So the majority answer said at the end. And that's, of course, the truth. Because when you now have a new variable, oh, sorry, a new element, I mean, you put it here. Because the other option would be terrible. What would happen if you wanted to insert a new element here? Then all these other elements would have to be moved around and would have to be pushed, uh, moved further down. And that's an O of N operation. So in this case, there's no question. No sane person would implement a stack any other way than adding at the end and removing from the end. And obviously, those are O of 1 answers. So from an efficiency point of view, you know, there's not much excitement in a stack. You can implement it efficiently either as a linked list or as an array list. So what about queues? So again, we'll start out with a linked list. And I have the same question. And I think for the queue, it's a little bit less obvious. So think that one through. So with the queue, you add and remove at opposite ends. So you add to the tail of the queue, and you remove at the head of the queue. And so that eliminates surely two of the answers, because the answer is all the possible combinations. But the question is, where should the tail and where should the head be? And it's completely our choice. As long as it works, you know, it's, it's fine, uh, as long as the operations consistently work. So there's, uh, you can't say, well, this arrow here looks more like the tail, so we're going to always add here. You have to see what, well, how does it work with the efficiency. And it's a singly linked list. Now, see, now I've given all the hints that I'm ever going to give. So can we bump this up here a little bit more? All right, so we seem to have a majority answer here. Um, so the majority says add should add after last, remove should remove first. So add here. So is adding to the end of the queue, is that an O of 1 operation? Uh, 
It doesn't look like it. Doesn't it look like it has to uh, go here, here, here to find the end? Yeah? Yeah, excellent. So you're yeah, exactly right. So there's, um, we talked about this last time that the Q, the, sorry, the linked list that was implemented in section 16.1 for simplicity did not have the reference to the end. But every sane person who implements a linked list, you know, assuming you need, to, uh, you need it for something other than just a stack, will supply that uh, reference. So we can assume that that reference is there. So this here is first, and this is last. And with that reference to the last, adding to the end is O of 1. Because all you have to do is if you have a new element is add the new element, add this reference here, and reroute this reference here. And that's O of 1, independent of the length of the queue. So adding here was O of 1. Removing the head is clearly O of 1 because all you have to do is reroute this link here. Now what about the other way around? Um, would that work? What if we what if we add here and remove here? Adding to the front is also O of 1 because you know you just have a new element and you put it in like that and that's an O of 1 operation just a couple of steps removing from the end on the other hand is O of n in a singly linked list so that's why we don't want to do it that way you could of course use a doubly linked list but why bother? Because we have another solution with a singly linked list where we, pr uh, where we just switch where the head and the tail of the queue are, and then a singly linked list is more efficient. There's no n need in paying for those other links um, since we have a perfectly good solution. So the correct solution is, is always this one here for uh, a queue as a linked list. So that's all, you know, not terribly difficult. Um, the only kind of interesting and sophisticated part is what happens uh, with an array implementation of a queue. So for a stack, sorry. For a stack, the array implementation is you know, not, not really difficult to think about because you just add a new element here and a new element here and so on. And then to pop them off, you know, you pop them off in the same way. But for a queue, you add in one end and you remove in the other end. So let's say that I already have a bunch of the elements in the queue. Well, let me first put, put a few in. Um, and I'll just call them here A, B, C. So let's say this is already in my queue. Now, actually, that's kind of a dumb. No, no that's fine. So, so this, is, this is how they are. And <clears throat> let's say that this thing here is the tail of the queue, and this thing here is the head of the queue. No, I'm, I'm not doing this. I'm just going to use this prepared picture here because then I don't have to think. So um, I did this exactly wrong. Um, let me show you that. So when we start out, the tail would be here. And the tail is where you insert something. So I'll insert an element A. And now I want to insert another element. Then the tail has to be incremented so that the tail now is here and B goes here. And now insert more elements just like this. And now here the tail would be pointing down here. So
So the tail is, the tail index is the next index where I insert something. The head is the one where I remove, since you're removed from the head of the queue. So now if I were to remove an A, then you know, the A, it's not actually removed from the queue, but all that happens is return, and now the head index is here. And now when I remove the B, then the head index moves over here. And so over time, you have this picture where some part of your array contains the data in the queue. And here's the head, and here's the tail. And this, it shifts around. So it's a contiguous part of your array, but as you remove things from the head, it moves further down. So after a while, you know, it might be for, uh, that this area here, right? the active area, so to speak, you know, might now be somewhere down here. And eventually it can happen that the active area gets, so, that gets all the way to the end. So you could be in a situation where you have elements like this in your queue. Here is the end of the array. And now I want to insert another element. Now, of course, what you could do to insert the other el new element is you could say, I will just grow the buffer. That's what we've done with the stack or with arrays in general. So you could say, I will grow the buffer, make it twice as large, and put the element M in here. What's, what's not so great about that idea? There's a lot of unused space, and first of all, it seems wasteful, and also it's not gonna get any better, right? Because as more stuff gets inserted and removed, that active area gets further and further down, and so the unused space would grow larger and larger. And so that sounds like a really terrible idea, and so it would be much better is if we can use the space, and using the space is perfectly easy. You just start filling in new elements in here. So in this case, the active area wraps around. Some of it is at the bottom of the array. Some of it is at the top. Of course, it could still happen that eventually the entire thing fills up. And at that point, you do have to make it larger. And that's just life. One would just have to, have to do that. <clears throat> but so the basic idea of a stack is what's called a circular array is to try to make use of the space, of the empty space at the beginning for as long as possible. So now when one removes elements here, so let's carefully see where, where we were. So this here was our tail. At this position here, our head and our tail happen to be at the exact same location. Um, so if one were to in insert one more, then one would have to grow, but let's say that doesn't happen. If we now remove things, then these ones would be removed. And eventually the tail would be here and then it would also wrap around to the beginning of the array and it would s start clearing out the beginning. And then it could happen that the entire uh, thing is empty and the head and the tail point somewhere in the middle. So that's the basic idea. Um, and it's a clever idea and it works, uh, <coughs> you know, it's, it's obviously uh, efficient. So add and remove since it's random access. You know where your head and tail index are. You need to look up something there. It doesn't matter how big the array is. They are O of 1 operation. Or O of 1 plus, really, because it could happen that the array needs to be resized. And then that, that's where the plus comes in. So uh, there's a couple of subtleties in the implementation. Oh, let's first do this clicker question, and then I'll do the subtleties with the implementation. So I want you to do this on a sheet of paper so that you can see exactly how this works. So let's say the buffer has size 10. And I'm inserting the numbers that you can see here. And I want you to tell me what is the contents of the buffer.
่าวาอ l right, so my phone tells me that the answers to this question are number one t w e n t percent, number two t w e n t percent, number three t h r percent, and number four f o u percent. So the voting population seems very divided on this issue. Um, so let's let's work through this. So um, I started out already with adding eight values. So but let me do it in slow motion. So here's when we started out, right? So now I'm going to add one to eight, and that means the tail now points here, because we're adding to the tail, so the tail moves up. Now we are removing one to four. We remove at the head. So what happens when you remove? When you call remove once? What happens to the one that's in here? What happens to it? Does it crumble to bits? Does it get overwritten by zero? Does it stay there? Well, that would have been a good clicker question. What happens with it? Does it get garbage collected? Well, let's look at the code. So here's the code for remove. So here it says the removed is elements of head. Head is head plus one modulo elements plus length, so the head gets incremented by one. But, but if it's at the very end, then it wraps around. Current size minus minus. That's just to keep track of the size, and uh, then return removed. So what happens to the element in the array? So what happens to this one here? Nothing, right? There was nothing in here that changed the value of elements bracket zero. There was no assignment to it. There was no thing that says elements bracket head equals something. So it just stays there. It's no longer of interest, but no one bothered to remove it. Eventually, it'll get overwritten. So all that happened is that the head now points here. And since I ask, you know, what's in the buffer? That's kind of important, right? So um, now the same thing happens three more times: one, two, three. So now head points to five. So now let's see. Now what do we do? Now four. So we're done here with four times removing. Now we're adding eight more things. And so let's see. So we added the tail. What are we adding? One to eight again? Yes. So we're adding one, two. Um, so at this point, the tail is here. Well, that's not true because if you look at the code, it says tail equals tail plus one mod ten. So that means the tail actually is at the beginning. So it's here. So now we add three, and now the three overwrites the one. That's okay. It's in the unused area, so there's no no danger here. Now the four goes here. Five, six. Uh, where's the seven go?
yeah, we now have to really make a new buffer, right? Because there's no room for the seven. We can't overwrite the five. The five hasn't been taken out yet. So now we have to make a new buffer and we'll do that in a minute. But it does mean that at this point we know the answer to the clicker question. What's the answer? So the answer has to be something else because the new buffer is how long now? It's twice as long. It has 20 elements. I think just by looking at these, I can tell you that none of these three here have 20 elements. Right? So it, I don't even have to look at what's inside them. None of those can be the right answer. So the answer is something else. Now you might say, not so fast. Maybe after this operation, it shrinks back down. And that's you know, not a totally unreasonable suge suggestion. Um, so let's see what actually happens and why that shrinking down doesn't happen. So now we're going to have to go through the trouble of making a buffer with 20 elements. I think that's 20. And now, where do, the, where do the numbers go? So there's two strategies that one could think of. One is to say, oh, we'll just you know, put, uh, just do, co copy them over. No, that's probably everyone's first guess. But what's wrong with that? Well, it's not going to work, right? Because where do we now want to put in our new number? What are we tr uh, dying to insert here? Seven, right? So we wanted to put a seven here. That's where. No, no, no. Three, four, five. I'm, uh, I'm all off. We want to put the seven here. And it does us no good to copy it over like this because then we would again have to like ma make room. So since we had to copy anyway, no, we might as well copy it in a way that is convenient for us. And so we're just going to copy it so that the head is again at the beginning. So the head was at the five. So, so we're copying all of these here over five, six, seven, eight, one, two. And then we go back to the uh, to the index 0, 3, 4, 5, 6. And now we're going to be moving the head here at 0 and I'm moving the tail here. So we've now copied the area from the head to the end. That was this area here that's here and I'll leave the other area white so that it's not not illegible so the three four five six in the white area is now at the end and it does the cost of the copying is unaffected by that right it's two loops instead of one loop but it's the, the work still means we had to shovel over n elements we just had to put them to strategically located places and <clears throat> now everything is actually very easy. Now we insert the 7 and the 8. That's here. And now we had to remove some things. We had to remove um, one, uh, four elements. So we removed the 5, 6, 7, 8. And so that means afterward the head is here. 5, 6, 7, 8. So it's here. And so now the contents of our buffer is 5, 6, 7, 8. They're still in there. 
2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. A few more times. Oh, actually, I do know. What's in there? Uh, this, is, this is Java, not C++. There's zeros in there, right? Because it's at the end. So 0, 0, 0, and so on. So that's the actual contents of the buffer. I know it's zeros because, well, actually, that's bogus, right? Because we have an array of objects. I'll, I'll go back to I don't know. Because um, they're nulls. And so if you have an integer stored by null, I guess I should write as nulls. So there's a bunch of nulls. They're objects, not numbers. And that's, that's the actual answer. And so if you get that answer, then, then you exactly know how the circular array list works. So a couple of, let's see where this shows up in the code. <coughs> so here we have this function grow if necessary. And that's over here. And grow if necessary looks at if the current size equals elements dot length. And then, the, then it's full. Now it makes the new buffer. It shovels them over here, making it in a single loop. And I'm starting at the head, and I'm wrapping the head around by this modular comp computation. So I'm putting the, the modular reduction into the bracket. And that way, when I do the copying, and I start here, then move over. At this point here, the next one over is going to be taken here because it's going to be 10 modulo 10, which goes back to 0. And so I'm doing something 10 times, starting at the head. And so here you see the 10 times. And I start at the head, and then I wrap around by the modulus computation. So here I'm now saying that's from henceforth is my buffer. And I set the head to 0 and the tail to 10 or the current size, because I knew it was full. So that's the code. Um, and there's <coughs> another subtlety here. Notice I have a head pointer and I have a tail pointer. And this exciting event of this relocation happened exactly when head equaled tail. So it was, it was happening at this juncture when the head and the tail pointed to the same location. So why didn't I just say if head equals tail here? I remember when I coded this up, I was very tempted to do that because you know, it's shorter. <coughs> Why didn't I do it? I don't get paid by the character, so uh, I had no motivation that way. But I remember thinking about it. That's, that's what I wanted to do. And then I said, oh, no, I can't. Why not? Yeah. Excellent. What if the queue is empty, right? Then the head and the tail are also the same. So I guess I could have said, if head equals tail and the size is greater than 0. But then the payoff didn't really seem to be there. And I was also thinking, could I remove the size? Could I compute the size from the head and the tail? And again, for the same reason, that is difficult. Because if the queue is completely full or if it's completely empty, then head and the tail are the same. Um, and I, what I could have done is I could have had a Boolean variable that says is empty or some such thing. But it didn't seem to be worth it. Uh, but it's a common thing to torture students to say, re-implement the queue, and you're not allowed to have a size variable, and you can only have one other Boolean variable. And 
So if I run out of homework assignments, then that, that would be a possible assignment. Um, so, <coughs> and I think that's all that's remarkable about this queue. Yeah. Okay, any questions about this or anything? So the takeaway from, uh, from the material today is really very simple. Uh, that you can always use a linked list for a stack or a queue and you can always use an array and you know, either way they find implementations. When you use an array for a queue, the details get a little complicated. Did anyone think of a homework question? All right, in that case I will show you another strategy if, uh, that, that's useful. And those of you at a lab on Tuesday have, have already seen this, but it will be a part of the exam, so I want to make sure that everyone understands how to do this. And that is, how do you debug linked lists? And so here we are in, uh, so in, in Eclipse. Um, I'm using the W linked list from worked example one. The stuff, oops, it's a, from what you went over with Dr. Heller. And so we want to, you know, have an idea on how this, uh, how to debug something. Um, I didn't introduce an error, unfortunately, because I forgot. Um, but um, that's how it's going to be in the exam. You're going to be given some piece of code that has some error in there uh, with some instructions on how to run the debugger. And then, of course, the, the crucial question will be, where is the error? Um, and uh, you could possibly spot the error without it. I don't, I don't know if you could or not. That, that depends a lot on luck, actually. Um, but I'll give you instructions on how to find it with the debugger. And you'll make screenshots, just like, um, did we do this last time? Did you have a screenshot of the debugger? You did, right? No? Okay, so this time you will be asked, I will ask you, make a screenshot of the debugger at this or that situation so I can make sure that, you, that, that you're actually running the debugger. It's, a, it's an essential skill. All right, so, let, yeah. I'm sorry? No more GitHub, no, no, sorry. Um, I, I would have liked to do it, um, but it's ne next time. Um, I mean, one, one great attraction is if we all get, would, would have gotten good enough at it over a couple of homeworks and we had become second natures, you wouldn't have to turn anything in, right? There would be no last minute messing around with, uh, with Canvas. And the other attraction, quite frankly, that I felt is, in fact, uh, I, I, was, I wanted to give extra points for anyone who checks in every five minutes or so, and I would have been able to see how the solutions develop. Would have been very interesting for me to see. Um, on <coughs> so, but th that's water under the bridge. All right, so um, let's look at this demo program here, and let's say we want to go to, uh, we want to trace through this call here uh, of, of where, how the iterator adds something. So set a breakpoint here. So here we're in the debugger. We'll step inside. All right, so here we now get to see what is position. And so what does it tell us? It tells us that position is a node of a linked list. And it says that the ID of that node is 23. And then we can see that next is another node whose ID is 31. And then I can trace through that and you can trace through more next. And then you can see a null here. And it is usually at this point that people give up. Because, you know, what do we know? We have, you know, we have a whole bunch of these nodes and it seems like a completely hopeless task to get any useful information out of the debugger. Um, but the secret weapon here is to draw the diagram. So if we draw a diagram, 
with all of the things that we find. So what actually is where we want to start with is we want to start with the first node. So we want to see what that is. And so let's inspect that. Here we go. Oops. Let's again. And so we see, okay, it is a pointer to a node. So now we get out our sheet of paper. And so for this graph paper is better. So we'll use graph paper. And so we have a link list. Oops, where's my graph paper? First, last. Okay, first points to. Oh, unfortunately, the inspector keeps going away. Um, okay, so is Shift Control I. Okay, Shift Control I. There we go. So it tells us it's a linked list dollar node. What's the dollar mean? It's an inner class. So the dollar separates the outer and the inner class. That's how they're represented in the VM. So, and we don't have to care about that in our diagram. We can just say node. And we know a node has a, a data and a next. And now, the crucial information here is that first points to a node whose ID is 32. So I'm going to write 32 in here. Why 32? Because it's 2 to the 5. So uh, Eclipse randomly assigns these IDs. So it's not actually at memory location 32. It's not actually have hash code 32. It's just that Eclipse uh, monitors the various objects that, uh, that it inspects. And it just assigns IDs to them. Um, and so all you know is that you have two references that both have 32. They point to the same thing. Yes? Yes. Right. Now, it's possible that if that Eclipse is good, that it keeps these relatively stable. I'm not really sure. Um, it has the potential of doing it because it could interact with the VM and figure out each time new was called. Um, th we'll try it out. That's a very good question that, I, that had not occurred to me. Um, so usually I do this in one, uh, in one debug run. But you're, you're so right that sometimes it just happens that you have to rerun it. And then, OK, yeah, that, that's sad then, yeah. Um, I mean, it's already sad that one has to use the debugger, but the one sometimes has to, right? So let's look at last um, in the same way. Uh, or, or actually, let's, let's do that later. Let's, um, so next is over here. It now points to, oh, I should also fill in the data. That's very useful. So the data here is uh, is Diana. Now, uh, the next one has Harry, and it has an ID of. If I can dock this, um, and 
Yeah. Okay, well that might work. All right, it says I need 27. Seven. The data was. Oh, I have to do it again, of course. This works a lot better with a sheet of paper. Um, the data was Harry, and then the next is 31. So here we have Harry. Oh, this was Diana. Here's Harry. Here's 31. Uh, should not have made it quite so long. Okay, so uh, when we follow this, we see there's five elements here before we get to know, so I don't have the patience to, to do those all. Um, but uh, so it shows that when you debug this, you want to find the smallest case that fails. Um, <coughs> But that's okay. In the scenario that I want to get at, I don't need it to know what's in, what's in the end. So that's my linked list. And now let's look at the iterator. So I am here. So the position of the iterator, um, let's see, what, what instance variables does an iterator have? Um, this is a doubly linked list. Um, It has position, and here's these two crazy booleans, is after next and is after previous. But we only have one position, so that makes our life easier. Iterator, iterator. I'll leave, leave room in case I need these booleans later. So. Now we're looking at the position, and we're inspecting it, and it points to the ID number 23. Really? And previous points to 32. Where the heck was previous? Oh, no, no, never mind. Um, so now I'm all confused because there is no 23 here right now. So one of two things happens. Either I wrote this one down wrong, or there is a, there is a bug already. So let's just double check what has happened here. So first, points to 32. Oh, wait. The next one here was a 23 and not a 27. So as you can see, this is tedious business. So now the position points to 23. Why? Where did we even get this position from? Let's look at this demo program. Oh, so, so the iterator started out 
and then we called next twice on it and now we are in this call to add. That's why I put my breakpoint. I can see the breakpoint here. So, so when I call next twice, why is it on the second element? Shouldn't it be on the third element? So let's look at the implementation of the iterate of the of the call to next and see what an iterator does. Aha, an iterator is first created where position is null. After the first call to next, the position will be on 32, and after the second call to next, it'll be on 23. So each call to next advances it by one. All right, so now let's go to the next step of our computation here. So the position was not null. Now it checks was the position last. And it wasn't that, so we're now in here. So it says node, new node equals new node. And now let's see what new node is. New node has ID 61, and so we can draw it. So, 61. It really was 61, right? So, now it says new node data equals element. Um, what is element anyway? So, let's mouse over. Element is Juliet. New node next equals position.next. Um, oops. Uh, oh, no. Now I hit the wrong key. and Yeah, this is bad. So, now I hit the wrong key and by accidentally quit the debugger. Um, and so now we'll, we'll see if, uh, what happens when we run it again. Did I actually quit the debugger? Pretty sure I did. Oh, yeah. So yes, and so now the bad thing happened that now new node, the ID is all different, just like what one of you had predicted. And so that's sad, so now one has to start all over with the numbering. So uh, it, it really is, is tedious. Why do I show it to you? Um, because there's some situations where it is so difficult to figure out how the links entangled themselves the wrong way that the debugger really is your only help. So you, you want to try everything to avoid this situation because it's, it is tedious, but sometimes there really is no other way. And so I'm, you know, I'm blown away that, it's, that you find uh, the ring, for example, so easy because it's entirely possible that you, you know, just to build up a ring with n numbers, so You know, you have these n numbers, and then you have a pointer that goes this way, and this way, and this way, and this way. And, I mean, anything could go wrong, right, in, the, in this process. And you have, a, you have a loop in the constructor where you build this all up. So it is totally easy to imagine that something would go wrong here. And in a situation like this, it's still reasonable to, to assume that you can actually go into the debugger. You make a ring with four elements. Some, somehow it didn't seem to work. It didn't pass the tester because the tester will check for all of these nulls. And in that case, it's not unreasonable to go into the debugger, watch the data structure that was built up, get out a sheet of paper. You only have, in this case, five elements, so you write the, the green numbers and you know, whatever they are. I'm just making them up. And so the crucial question in the end is, when you follow five links, do you get back to the link that's at 45? And there's really, in the ring, there's no other way of doing it but looking at the numbers. What helps me out with a linked list is it says Diana and whatever because it was already pre-filled. But when you first construct the ring, all, all the data is null. 
So you have null, 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 and null, and so that itself doesn't give you enough information. You had a question? No? Okay. So, um, so having the ID numbers is, is just essential. The ID numbers, of course, like I said before, only make sense if you have a sheet of paper. That's why previously I insisted that you, know, you draw some of these things. If you can't draw them, the debugger will help you totally nothing. You know, you'll just, it'll just be in a complete fog. So you have to draw the picture, you have to label them, and then it often gives you an idea of, of what you did wrong. So give it a try when you get stuck in the homework. It is possible to debug these things, and like I say, it's an essential skill. All right, I will see you next Monday.